afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and thank you to you guys for choosing to brave the debts of distributed consensus with me today. Distributed consensus is the problem of how to make decisions in a distributed system. One sec, there we go. Uh, how to make decisions in a distributed system without assuming synchrony or reliability. If we can achieve consensus, spoiler alert, we can, otherwise this would be a very short talk, um, <laughs> then we can do amazing things. We can construct huge, powerful distributed systems that provide really strong consistency guarantees. And in fact, we see this in practice every day. I would claim that most distributed systems make use of consensus one way or another. Some systems use it directly to provide uh, strong consistency, for example, over transa uh, transactions on a database. Others don't seem to use it at all, except there are containers that they're then deployed, and Kubernetes manages them, and Kubernetes uses etcd, which uses Raft, to achieve consensus. Consensus is, however, famously tricky to understand. When I say I work on consensus, people look at me like I'm crazy, check I'm, check I'm real, uh, and they say things like, oh, it's, you know, it's magic to me. So if you don't get every single aspect of every little thing that goes on in this talk, you are not alone. You are absolutely in the majority. Do feel free to come uh, and talk to me, to contact me, and to speak with me at the end and, and ask plenty of questions. That's how we learn. So before we dive into the technical depths of distributed consensus, I wanted to talk a bit about my story so far and how I ended up on, here, on the stage today. So back in 2016, uh, when Dahlia was here uh, talking to you guys, I was working at VMware uh, as an intern, and I was working on how we can improve Paxos, the most famous distributed consensus algorithm, and make it perform better. I wrote up this result in this paper, uh, Flexible Paxos, and then a few years later, I wrote my thesis on distributed consensus. It's 150 pages. It's uh, quite an intense read. I was very impressed to see uh, the morning paper covering it in such depth. And when I was about three quarters of the way through my thesis, which was all about kind of improving the performance of Paxos, I said to my, my mentor at the time, I've got this great idea. And he said, are you done writing your thesis? And I said, no, 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 I've got this idea. At the time, I was writing all these optimizations, and I was getting stuck in the proofs. There was all these moving parts in consensus. I'm supposed to understand it, but I was beginning to not understand it. It was all looking very ugly. And as someone who started as a functional programmer, I thought, what if I move from representing state as, a, as mutable and move to representing state as immutable? That would make it easier for me to understand everything that's going on. It would make my proofs way cleaner and way simpler. So I said to my mentor, I've got this idea. I'm going to switch how I represent uh, state when I'm doing consensus. And it's going to require me to rewrite my whole thesis. <laughs> and he just went, no. Uh, so I, I, I didn't do it. I needed to finish. And I submitted my thesis on time thankfully, um, and passed my Viva uh, in January of this year. But as soon as I was done, I was like, right, I'm free. I'm going to write the stuff I wanted to write all along. Uh, and that is this third paper here. This is the paper titled Generalized Solution to Consensus. So this is taking the work from the earlier paper, the Flexible Paxels paper, and my thesis, and talking about it using immutable state. And that is what I'm going to be discussing in more detail today. So I first came across the problem of consensus when I was an undergrad. and I had this uh, dream that I was going to build this amazing distributed system. It was going to have everything. It was going to be super high performance, low latency, high throughput, super scalable. We're going to provide strict serializability. We're going to provide linearizability, none of those weak consistency things. They don't need those. It's going to be super reliable. It's going to tolerate any kind of faults. It would be amazing. I was young and naive. <laughs> the wake up call shortly followed. So these um, two papers uh, are a very like, great example of this. So one of these papers titles, 100 Impossibility Results in Distributed Computing. That's it, just a paper that tells you a thing you can't do and then does it again. 
99, 100 times in total. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, and on the other side, we've got this really infamous paper. So this paper is uh, informally known as like the FLP paper or the FLP result. And this says that solving distributed consensus is impossible. This is probably one of the like joint for the most uh, famous paper in distributed consensus. And I would see this as being the first paper in distributed consensus. So if you have a technical problem and you want researchers to spend decades working on that problem, write a paper claiming that it's impossible. <laughs> and they will put in a lot of effort to proving you wrong, and myself included in that. And it's not just in old theory papers we see that we've got these problems with uh, achieving consistency and achieving consensus in distributed systems. Uh, this is a figure that I love. I use it to give students nightmares. It's not mine. It's from a really good paper called Consistency in Non-Transactional Distributed Storage Systems that was published in the ACM Communications Survey. And it's giving an overview of the consistency le levels that are available in distributed systems, even when they don't support transactions. <laughs> so if you add transactions to this, it becomes far more of a far more of a mess. At the very top, we've got this uh, guarantee, which is linearizability. So this is the guarantee that when you send a request to the system, you get back a response, and it will appear as if that re request was executed atomically at some point between when you sent it and when you got it. That's a great guarantee. I mean, our distributed systems looks like it's not distributed at all. Wonderful. Let's, let's use that. The problem in doing that is that we often need to solve problems like consensus uh, or similar problems like atomic broadcast in order to actually implement this in practice. And they're really kind of expensive and painful. And so we have this whole plethora of alternative uh, guarantees that provide better performance or better fault tolerance than uh, systems that implement linearizability. And this survey uh, showed more than 50 of them. So to avoid getting too into the weeds today, this whole talk is just going to be about deciding a single value. That's it. You think that's not much for a talk? That was also the entirety of my thesis. <laughs> System, it's got two components. Servers, they're like servers. They're long running. They have persistent storage. They're passive. Clients, they're like normal clients. They, they're active, they send some messages, they come, they go, that's it. And all we're going to do is decide a value. Now, I gave this talk earlier this year, <laughs> and I had an attendee come up to me and tell me that I had stolen an hour of his life because he was expecting a blockchain talk because this talk was about consensus, and I hadn't made it clear that I wasn't talking about blockchain. And I promised him, I said, I'll make it clearer next time. I'm making it clearer. <laughs> when I say distributed consensus, I'm specifically talking about what we know as non-Byzantine fault tolerance. So in my world, all the machines do as I tell them. It's not actually what my world is like at all. Uh, <laughs> but they might be slow, uh, and they might be a bit unreliable, and there's asynchrony, but ultimately they will follow the algorithm. Byzantine fault tolerance doesn't assume this. That's a whole new set of problems that are far more dip tricky than the ones we're going to talk about today. The problem we're talking about today it seems so simple on the surface. We need to guarantee two things to solve consensus. Firstly, safety. All the clients in, this, in the system learn the same decided value. That seems reasonable, right? And progress. Eventually, a client will learn the value that's been decided. What makes this more tricky is the fact that safety has to hold regardless. It doesn't matter if the machines fail, if they come back again or not, if messages are dropped, if they're reordered, we can't place a bound on how quickly a message uh, will be received. We can't place a bound on how quickly a machine's going to respond. We can't rely on clocks. 
It is the, like the wild west out there, and we have to ensure safety regardless. However, when it comes to proving progress, we do have to make some assumptions about the liveness of the system, and that's what, how we circumvent and dodge that impossibility result that we saw earlier. So I said the FLP result was joint first for the most famous paper in distributed consensus. This is the other one. Um, this is Part-Time Parliament by Leslie Lamport. If you haven't read this paper, I do encourage you to read it. I think it's a great kind of historical interest paper. Uh, it's also pretty far down my list of recommendations for actually learning about consensus, however. <laughs> A lot of people have written much better explanations of uh, Lamport's algorithm, including himself. <laughs> it's, quite a, it's quite a dense and peculiar read. <laughs> so let's see what Lamport has to say about the problem of distributed consensus and his solution, Paxos. The Paxos algorithm, when presented in plain English, is very simple. Brilliant. Love a good simple algorithm. This consensus algorithm follows almost unavoidably from the properties you want to satisfy. That's amazing, right? You just think about, the pro about distributed consensus. Think about that problem I showed you, and you would derive Paxos on your own. You couldn't help it. You'd, it's like you'd fall over it. It's just there. Great. I, why, why do I need to do a PhD in this? His view, however, is not shared more broadly. Um, <laughs> There is a reason why he got a Turing Award. <laughs> um, the engineering community has some different things to say about Paxos. So these quotes are taken from the Raft consensus paper. Paxos is exceptionally difficult to understand. That's quite different to very simple, isn't it? Um, we conclude that Paxos doesn't provide a good foundation for either systems building or education. <laughs> He's quite brave to put that in a paper. <laughs> so, what I hope to have convinced you so far with this kind of little overview is two things. Firstly, Paxos is difficult to understand. It's subtle. That's the main reason why people have difficulty with it. And that's why uh, papers like the Raft Consensus paper have been so popular. And secondly, Paxos doesn't perform well it's slow to actually make any decisions. And that's why we can't just have all our systems implement linearizability. It also doesn't provide, it provides some degree of fault tolerance, but it doesn't necessarily provide us with amazing fault tolerance. So since Lamport published that paper, and since the original FLP paper, there have been so many papers in consensus. Um, I've read a lot of them, so I've really <laughs> felt the pain of the number of papers there have been in consensus. Um, literally hundreds of them. And they all try to address one of these two problems, right? They're either trying to make Paxos perform better, great, or they're trying to make Paxos more understandable, good. But they rarely try to do both. And that's what I wanted to do, and that's the pain in the wall that I hit whilst I was writing my thesis. So I'm gonna go back to basics, and I'm gonna change the way that we think about consensus in two key ways. The first, the more obvious one that I mentioned earlier, is immutability. So I'm going to use uh, persistent write once registers when talking about consensus. This makes it so much easier, at least for me, to understand what's going on about the system and to reason about what is and isn't safe behavior. And secondly, and perhaps less intuitively, is generality. So when it comes to distributed systems, we can't have our cake and eat it. We can't have that amazing distributed dream that I once dreamt of. And so I don't think there's any point of improving Paxos and trying to get a silver bullet, a better than Paxos algorithm that in every system, in every scenario, will always give you better performance and better fault tolerance and strong consistency and just be everything. So instead, what I want to do is come up with a general algorithm that has a lot of potential to be um, configured for different systems, to take advantage of the different properties of different systems, and to get good performance. Paxos is a kind of one-size-fits-all solution, whereas what I want is a solution, of, what I want is a whole shop of different sizes. So today's talk has got three parts. Firstly, we're going to reframe the problem of distributed consensus using these immutable uh, registers. 
Secondly, I'm going to explain this like famous and scary Paxos algorithm. And I'm not just going to explain the Paxos algorithm, I'm going to explain a substantial generalization over the Paxos algorithm that weakens its requirements. And thirdly, I'm going to put this generalization to some use, hopefully. I give an example of where we could use this in a example uh, like a particular system. So let's get on with it. Consider a world where we just have one server. Oh, please, oh, please. <laughs> There's one server. It's got one uh, write once register in persistent storage. And we're going to try and achieve consensus. Client comes along. They have a value that they want to be decided, in this case, A. And they're going to talk to the server. I propose we decide this value of A. And server's like, OK, we can do that. We'll decide A. I'll keep a record of it. I'm going to write it in that register of mine. I've accepted your proposal. And the client's like, yay, great. I won. <laughs> I got what I wanted. It's A. You can probably see what's going to happen now. Another client comes along, this time input value B, conflict. And so the client's going to send the message to the server and say, I propose B. And the server's like, nah, we already, we already reached consensus. For safety, we can only decide one value. So I'm going to tell you I already accepted A. I'm going to tell you about what happened. So the client learns the decided value was A. They didn't get the um, value that they wanted, but at least as a side effect, they've learned what the value is. This is great. In fact, this actually solves uh, how I would define distributed consensus. We have safety because they've learned the same value. And as long as that server's up, we have progress. As long as that server's up. I wish we lived in that world. We don't. So. Let's make our system distributed, and let's have three servers instead of one. Now let's try to apply a similar algorithm again. We could say uh, you have to write, a client has to write to one register to decide a value, but then we could decide different values. We could say a client has to write to all the registers to decide a value, but then that would be even worse than the original algorithm because now we have three servers, and if any one of the three fails, we won't be able to make progress. So let's write to a majority of servers, two of three, right? That means that there would be an overlap between any two majorities, and if one failed, we could still re reach a decision. So let's look at that in practice. Client comes along, value A, proposes it to all three servers. The servers write the value A to their register, registers, sorry, and they respond with the accepted A message. Client learns that A was decided. Great. Now the client comes along. Input value B proposes. Servers this time again are like, nah, already reached consensus. Sorry. It was A that was decided. And the client learns the input value was A. We have got safety, which is great. Unfortunately, we don't actually have the progress property. So we could have a scenario like this. Three clients come along, and each of these three clients talks to one of the three servers first. And then we've got one register that's got the value A, one register with the value B, and one register with the value C. We said these were write once registers. We wanted this immutability property. Uh, we're, we're pretty stuck now. <laughs> There's nothing we can do without overwriting these registers. So we don't have progress. The progress means that we couldn't get ourselves stuck in a deadlock like this. So we need a way of resolving this situation. Now, instead of switching to mutable registers, where we're then going to have difficulty ensuring safety, I want to switch to a world where we have a series of write once registers. We're going to try to reach consensus in the first, re in the first register, and if we end up in a split scenario like that, let's try again. We can try again until we succeed. And to save me drawing out far too many diagrams, I'm going to introduce the idea of a state table. A state table represents the state of the servers in a system. Each column is one of the servers. So we've got three servers here. And each row is a set of registers. And you can see these registers contain the same values as the previous slide. 
You'll note on here that some of these boxes contain a hyphen. This hyphen represents a special null value. We'll see what the null value is useful for specifically later, but at a high level, a null value is a way for a client to basically block a register, um, freeze it, and stop anyone else, any of the other clients, from getting in there and writing to that register. So we've got some registers, some clients that may or may not do some writes on some reads of these registers, but like, when do we actually get some consensus? When, do a, when does a client learn the decided value? This is where the generality idea comes in. We're gonna say that a value is decided when it has been written to the same register on a non-empty, I should say non-empty there, non-empty subset of servers known as a quorum. So if you're familiar with distributed systems, you'll be thinking quorums, majorities, read-write quorums, all this fun stuff. For now, don't think about quorums like that. Just think about quorums as non-empty subsets of servers. Right now, there's no reason for them to need to intersect. We'll see later whether we do or do not need any intersection properties between them. And we'll represent our choice of quorums using a quorum table. So as I said, they can be any sets, they don't have to intersect. So here's just a random example that I picked. We'll see later that the ones that you pick would depend on the kind of system you're trying to deploy consensus on. So here, register zero has a quorum that's composed of two servers. Uh, register one has two different servers. Register two onwards has either of those two pairs. And putting together the state table and the quorum table, we can see whether a system has reached consensus or not. So here's the majority quorums example that we saw earlier. So regardless of what register we're talking about, we're gonna use majority, so two of three servers. Here's an example state table. And in blue, we can see where a decision has been reached. Here we see two um, registers that are the same register that contain the same value. And we say that that means a decision has been reached. If a client sees this, they're good to go. Here's a different example of a quorum table. And here's an example of a corresponding decision table, uh, uh, co sorry, corresponding state table. Here we can see that two decisions have been reached. that are both for value A. The advantage of allowing multiple decisions to be reached is that if one of, the core, one of the servers is unavailable, we may still be able to make progress. So in this case, if server S3 failed and another client came along, they could reach consensus again on value A, even though S3 has failed. I'll go into the details of how that works, but just at a high level, it's useful to be able to have different more than one decision on different quorums as long as they all decide the same value. They don't necessarily all decide the same value though. <laughs> so here we have a quorum table of some quorums, um, and here we have a problematic scenario, right? The clients are free to write whatever values they wanna write and read whatever, value, and read whatever is there, and they've decided to write two different values. This isn't safe at all. And it's not just on the same register set that we can have this problem. We can also have this problem across register sets. So here we see um, both the value A and the value B have been decided. So we can't live in this free and happy world where clients can just write to whatever registers they want, and as soon as they see that a quorum contains the same value, they're good to go. We're gonna have to place a restriction on when clients can write. And this is that restriction. Before a client writes a value to register I, it must ensure that no other values could be decided in register zero up to I. So I'm gonna write into register I, but it's my responsibility before I do that to check that none of the previous uh, registers could decide a different value. So everyone has to check that they're not violating safety. Each of the clients needs to make that check and then overall, we're never gonna get two different decisions. So that's the end of part one. We've defined consensus with immutable state, and we saw a solution to consensus that worked for one server, but then we tried to get a solution for two. It didn't quite work out. We saw a vague safety rule. We're not really sure what's going on. We haven't actually solved the problem yet. This is where Paxos comes in. We're gonna split that safety rule into two parts. 
We're going to have that before a client writes a value to a register i, it must ensure that no other values are decided in the register set i. So for any given row in that table, I need to check that no, one, that no other decisions are going to be made in that row for a different value. And secondly, I need to check with the previous rows, the previous registers, to check that a decision isn't going to be made. And Paxos handles each of these separately. So a solution to the first one is referred to as the register allocation rule. Paxos allocates registers to clients in a round-robin fashion and then tells those clients only write one value to that register. What that means in practice is that only one value is ever going to be written to every, any set of registers. If only one value is going to be written to any set of registers, only one value is ever going to be decided by that set of registers. Or it's actually a stronger uh, guarantee than we needed. And I'm not going to talk about it today, but some of the work I do doesn't use this assumption because it is stronger than we needed. So that's how we've solved the first of these two requirements. That was the easier one to solve. Now we're going to look at the second requirement. How can a client ensure that it's not going to write a value that's different from a previous decision? And this is how Paxos implements this. Paxos requires clients to read at least one register from the quorums of register sets 0 to i minus 1. So if I'm a client, I'm going to write to i, which is 4, say. I need to talk to all the previous quorums for registers 0 to 3. I need to talk to at least one person in each of those sets and ask them about what happened, what is in your register. Tell me about the state of the system before I arrived here in the system. I need to make sure of two things. Firstly, all those registers need to be written. If they're unwritten, another client could come in, write a different value, and cause a safety violation. But what if they're not written? That's where the null value we saw earlier comes in. So what the client's going to do is they're going to read them, and if they're, if they're empty, they're going to write null. They're going to freeze the system. They're going to say, stop. Whatever happened, happened, and I'm going to learn about that, but don't start writing new values to these registers. Don't make decisions, because it might be different from what I'm going to do. So I'm just going to write nil just to block that register, stop anyone else getting in there. Secondly, the client, when they then do their write, has to write the same value as they saw from the greatest register that they read in this, in this first part. So that means that decisions may have been made in the, future, in the past. And so I'm going to read the values. And if I see a value, I'm going, to re I'm going to write the same value. That's kind of sad for clients, right? They may not get to write the value they actually want to write. They might be left basically picking up the pieces from another client. Um, they could be running at the same time as another client. The other client could have just failed or just like given up and walked away. So they're going to tidy up the mess and they're going to learn about the decision that was made. But they have to, for the purposes of safety, write the same value to ensure that there's not a conflict in decisions. So that's how we deal with the second of these two safety criteria. So at a high level, Paxos is a two-phase algorithm which means it can reach, can make a decision in two round trips. It may take more than that, but two is, is the minimum that we're going to have to do. And this first phase of the algorithm just ensures safety. It doesn't actually like, do anything useful towards consensus. All it does is implement those two rules we saw before. The second phase is where the client actually gets to start writing values into registers, and reading and knowing that they've been written can say like, oh, a decision has been reached. So the real like the work gets done in the second phase, and the first phase is just checking for safety, ensuring that we're not going to violate safety. If we didn't care about safety, we could just skip that first phase altogether. And Paxos uh, uses requires all quorums to intersect, and so it tends to use ma uh, majorities. So that's like an obvious. You want all your quorums to intersect. Majorities seem reasonable. People can understand majorities. And then if a minority fail, then the system should still be up. That's simple enough, right? So now we're going to delve deeper again. You know, it's like an onion. We're like peeling off all these layers. 
Um, we're going to delve deeper into the details of how this Paxos works, one phase at a time. So phase one, this is our safety checking phase. This is read the state of the system, in other words, literally read the registers, um, and freeze it. So write some nils in there if we see empty registers. So it's basically read and freeze, oh, sorry, freeze and read, actually. Freeze and read so that you know what you can do safely in the next phase. So to begin, a client chooses an allocated register set I. Note the word allocated there. So that's the register allocation rule that we saw before. This client can't just use any register they want. They have to use one of the ones they were allocated. And they're going to send a message. This message is called prepare. They're going to send a message prepare I to all the servers. When a server receives the message prepare I, it's going to look at its registers. If there are any unwritten registers between 0 and I minus 1, the, the server is going to write nil into those registers. It's going to block them out, stop them from changing. And then that server is going to respond to the client with the message promised. Promised includes the register set that we're talking about here. And then if the server has any registers that contain values, it's going to return the register number and the value of the greatest register. So that's the register with the highest register number. And that there is going to help us implement the second rule that we saw. So the client waits and collects these promised messages from the servers. And once it's got enough messages, a quorum of messages, it's going to choose the value V from the greatest register that it saw from these pr promised messages. If it doesn't see anything, if, if all the registers are empty, then it can propose whatever value it likes, which will be the input value. So at this stage, all we've done is read registers and write nil. We haven't actually written anything of use to the system. But we have learned what register can I safely write to and what value can I safely write to that register. In the second phase, we actually get to, get to start writing to registers and implement consensus. So the client sends the proposed message to all servers. This is similar to the proposed message we saw earlier, except now it includes I, which is the register. When a server receives the message, propose IV, then it writes the value V to the register and responds with accepted. So accepted means, like, I have done that. You're good to go. The client terminates when it's received accepted messages from a quorum of servers. So it knows that I've, saved, I've been successful, I've written that value to enough registers, and I've learned that, that is the decided value. I can output that value. That might have been a lot to take in, so <laughs> we'll work through an example now. So in this example, we've got three servers. These are the circles. And we've got a state table on the side, currently empty. We've not done anything. System's just woken up and is new to the world. Client comes along. As you've seen before, client one, input value A. And they're going to start the phase one of Paxos. They're going to send the message, prepare R1. The servers are going to receive this message. They're going to look at their registers. And each of them is going to see they've got a register that's unwritten. So they're going to write null into those registers. And the servers are all going to respond. They're all going to, in practice, they're all going to respond. But once we've received two of three, once we've seen a quorum, we can proceed. So I'm just going to draw just the two messages to make that clear. Now we can proceed to the second phase. And we've learned that the client can propose its own value A to register R1. So we see that in the proposed message. The servers write the value A into register R1, and they respond, saying, I've accepted your proposal. I've done as you asked me to do. Um, and so when the client sees this from two or three servers, they're like, cool, consensus reached. I'm going to output A. Another client comes along into the system. They're going to send the message, prepare R2. Registers were allocated round robin, say. The servers don't need to change their state at all. There's no unwritten registers. 
but they are going to respond with the greatest register and the value inside it. So in this case, they're responding with the greatest register, R1, and the value that's in R1A. So they're letting the client know, if you, basically this message reads, if you want to write to R2, you should know that the greatest value I've seen is A in R1. And the client collects these messages again. Once it's received two of them, it can safely proceed to the sec second phase. Unfortunately, this client, in this case, isn't able to write their own value A. They're going to have to write uh, their own value B, sorry. They're going to have to write the value A. So the client sends the message propose R1, R2A, so write the value as requested, and service responds saying, hey, I've accepted your proposal. And the client learns the output value. So Paxos requires each of these two phases to use the same quorum, an intersecting quorum, regardless of what you're doing. It doesn't matter whether you're phase one or phase two. It doesn't matter if you're writing into register seven or register four. It doesn't matter. You need to use an intersecting quorum. If you need intersecting quorums, majorities are an obvious choice, right? But at the beginning, when I used the word quorum, I said, don't assume they intersect. You can use any set you want. And in fact, you can use any set that you want. So we have a new, much weaker quorum intersection requirement. This is what was uh, shown in the Flexible Paxos paper that I showed earlier. When you're doing a quorum table, you can put whatever quorums you want in there. Any non-empty sets don't have to intersect at all. The only thing is that when a client wants to use a register I, so when they want to reach consensus at register I, when they want to write to that, they need to get at least one participant from the previous quorums to participate in their first phase. But that is it. That is the only quorum intersection requirement. There is no quorum intersection requirement between two quorums for the second phase of the algorithm, say. So that was a lot of very kind of general high-level things. Let's uh, have a look at an actual example of this. So classic Paxos, as I mentioned earlier, uses two phases. Any client can decide a value. If you have like, seen a previous consensus system, however, like Raft uh, or Zookeeper, view stamp replication, any of those, you'll know that you don't actually run two phases of the algorithm every time you want to get something done. Instead, you use the first phase of the algorithm to elect a leader. And the second phase of the algorithm is used then to reach consensus. This means that we can actually reach consensus in only one round trip. That's, that's great. One round trip is, is half of two. The problem is that there's only one client who can do that, the client who's the leader. If I'm a client who's not the leader, I have to send my message to the leader, and then the leader has to send me back the message, which is a lot like a round trip. <laughs> So we just we ended up at the same place again. Well, in practice, we really need two round trips again. Wouldn't it be great if we could have an algorithm that could allow any client in the system to achieve consensus in just one round trip? Now, it depends on uh, how important this is. It depends on the system you're deploying. If you're deploying over a large geographic area, this might be really useful. If your mach three machines are on the same rack, which they shouldn't be if you're deploying consensus because the rack fails and you, that's the, the, you're out, <laughs> um, then maybe this doesn't matter. Maybe two round trips doesn't matter. Um, but I think in some, in some cases, I think this is important. So as I said, with um, coming up with a very general algorithm, we're going to specialize it for the properties of a specific system. So I'm going to assume two things. Firstly, I'm going to assume that these failures are rare. We will tolerate failures. In fact, we will tolerate the same failures as Paxos. Minority of nodes can fail. We'll tolerate it. But we're going to assume that they don't most of the time. So we're actually going to make use of more nodes. But we're going to tolerate the fact that um, a minority of servers may fail. And secondly, I'm going to assume that each server physical server hosts both a client and a server. So this is how most of these systems are actually set up. Consensus is used to implement atomic broadcast or state machine replication or primary 
um, primary backup replication. And here it's often the case that the servers are actually making decisions between, each, between themselves. So they are themselves both a server and a client. This has the nice property that if you're a client, you have a server that you can talk to for free. Because they're, they're, they're running on the same host as you. You don't have to send a message over a network. Message might be slow, get delayed. You've got kind of free access to one participant of the system. But everyone else is over a network. They're expensive. So here is an example of what a quorum table might look like for a system such as this. We have three participants. And we've partitioned the set of registers at register 9. Arbitrary number. Don't worry about it. Um, the first set, so that's 0 to 9, I've said, if you want to reach consensus, you have to involve everybody. Everyone has to agree. All three servers have to be on board for you to make a decision. As a client, you've got to write into three registers. Register 10 onwards, however, just two. Two's fine, just like Paxos, just like what we saw before, the, the familiar world that we had. So what this does is it gives clients two options as to how to reach consensus. Firstly, there's what I'd call the fast path. Again, slightly depending on what system you're using. If waiting for that extra server like, is actually really slow, then this wouldn't be the fast path. But this is about you know, uh, optimizing for a particular system. So in the first path, the client executes phase one just with its local server. It doesn't need to talk to two servers, because remember that weakened quorum intersection requirement we saw earlier? You only need to intersect with uh, quorums from lower register sets. If we include everyone, then everyone includes me. So I can just talk to my local server for execute phase one nice and quickly. All's good. In phase two, I'll include everybody. At the same time, we still have option to do the Paxos the way we always did it. We're going to include a majority of people in phase one and majority of people in phase two. We have a new um, best case scenario. We have a new option for clients to take, a new path that they can take, but the old one's still there. We just go back to doing Paxos, doing consensus the way we were always doing it. The advantage of this is a client can now, any client in the system can now reach consensus in just one round trip. The downside is that we've increased the quorums from majorities to all the participants. Um, and we may need more rounds if failures occur. That is just one example of how we can use this. This is a new, I think, more interesting example. There is, if you look online, a more common example of how flexible Paxos is, is used with uh, multi-Paxos. But I included a different example from usual just for fun. So what have we learned? Immutability here, I think, really, really helps with reasoning about what's going on in, in our distributed system. And I think it could help more broadly in, in areas beyond distributed consensus. And generality allowed us to uh, specialize the algorithm for the needs of a particular system, as we saw with the all aboard consensus. Paxos can chill out. <laughs> It can relax. It can relax its requirements for quorums to intersect. And in my thesis, I show a bunch of other relaxations from how we don't need quorums at all. You can just proceed safely in many cases without quorums, how the client doesn't need to follow that rule, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot more things we can do to kind of play with this algorithm. And in terms of that playing, you know, there's a lot that we can achieve as well. Different quorum systems give us very different trade-offs different, for different scenarios. Paxos is a single solution to distributed consensus. And I, by Paxos, I'm also meaning all the similar algorithms, so Raft, Zookeeper, et cetera, et cetera. This is one approach to consensus based on two phases and majorities. But there's loads of ways we can solve this problem. You don't have to take this one-size-fits-all solution. That's it for me. Um, and I will be up here afterwards if you want to ask any questions. Like two, like in okay, cool. We can do like two questions. Yep, we got one here. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, to your last point, is there any example you can think of that would really benefit from distributed consensus that's absolutely not well served by Paxos or sort of similar algorithms? 
I think the main area where Paxos falls down is uh, over a large geographic area. When you care about latency, having two round trips is 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 painful. Um, so I think two. I think you know. Splitting when your system goes from being in one data center to across multiple data centers, which is a really good thing to do with fault tolerance. And if you care about fault tolerance, consensus is you know, possibly an option for you. Um, I, think that's, I think that's a nice use case. Generally, uh, people now, you know, Paxos for a long time was renegated to like configuration management. And like it was very much like a sideline thing, and you like you wouldn't put Paxos on like the critical path of your system. Whereas since the RAF paper, people are like, oh, consensus is cool. Like we can use it to like implement like strongly consistent key value stores. And now they're putting Paxos right on the critical path of the system. And so generally, with this optimization and with the more normal uses of it, you can reduce the quorum that you normally do the second phase quorum from a majority to a smaller group. And that allows you to reach consensus just faster, um, which is uh, useful if you're going to put Paxos right in the middle of your application. So with the extensions that you've put onto Paxos uh, in, in this discussion, is there, still, um, is there still a strong case for using Raft in live systems versus the implementations that you've discussed here? That's a great question. Um, I. I'm try, I'll try not to get too deep into the answer because I could talk all day about this. So um, Raft isn't that different from Paxos, from multi-Paxos. Um, mostly what the Raft paper did is an incredibly good job of explaining what was going on and being specific about how to use Paxos to implement state machine replication. And therefore, the difference between uh, multi-Paxos multi and Raft is not very big, so it really doesn't matter which one you're, you're using in practice. The only thing I would say is that to make uh, Raft more understandable, they've used a very strong leadership model. So they elect one of the participants as the leader, and they're like, you're in charge. You do everything. It's all your job, which makes the leader, which was already a bottleneck in multi-Paxos, an even bigger bottleneck. And when that leader fails, it can take a while for the, the new leader to get, get elected and get up to date. And so I think if you really, if you care about performance, you probably shouldn't be using Raft in the first place. You should be using a more normal kind of multi-Paxos or like Zookeeper kind of thing um, with a weaker leadership model. Cool. Uh, well, well, we'll take them offline for the next talk. Uh, Heidi's here for all of Stringloop as well. So she will be around uh, and you can uh, talk Paxos all week, I mean, if, if Heidi wants, of course. So, uh, thank you so much. Thank you.